Today, I'm talking with you about cultivating that meaningful relationship with science. Yes, that's right, you and science, because you became a science teacher instead of an English teacher, or a science teacher instead of an art teacher. There's something that drew you there, and I think even if you don't have that naturally like effervescent, bubbly personality, you still can bring it in a major way in terms of enthusiasm to your students and modeling a love for the content. So stick with me, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Modeling our love for science is the topic today, but very quickly first, if you haven't been here before, you don't know who I am, my name is Lisa. I'm out here trying to reignite everybody's fire for teaching science, get us out of that burnout mentality, that doldrum, every day is the same kind of day thing, by really inspiring you to use student-centered instructional strategies to stop being the authority in your classroom, to take the reins of instructional design and realize that there's so much more than just delivering a lesson. Um, I'm here to do all those things for you. And I have a plenty of experience in it. I was actually a chemist before I came to teaching. And I spent seven years in the lab between graduate research and actual industrial research. Then I got a job totally looking for more social connection, get out of the lab, wasn't the place for me. Uh, and I ended up in cyber school. <laughs> so if you have been teaching during the pandemic, that 2020 year, you can totally appreciate how that didn't quite fulfill my expectations or my desires for becoming a teacher to begin with. And so I fell into this trap of lecturing for a long time, even though I always wanted to be that inquiry-based science teacher. Eventually, I had to find a way out, but it wasn't out of my school and it wasn't into a different learning environment. It doesn't wasn't with different students. It was with different strategies. And that's what I'm here to share with you. Um, I do that in several ways besides here on YouTube or here in the podcast if you're listening. I do it in a free community I call the Student Centered Science Teachers Society. You can connect with us at community.labineverylesson.com anytime, totally free for everyone. And you can actually get these videos early before they post on YouTube, uh, depending on, you know, how crazy my life is at the time. Sometimes it's very early and sometimes it's not much notice at all. Uh, I also run two paid memberships for content and training, professional development, and resources. The first is the Active Learning Laboratory, where I really focus in on what student-centered learning is, how you can adopt strategies, what those strategies are, and I lead you into the space of instructional design. We also have monthly new products in there to support your delivery in the classroom. In the Digital Instructional Design Studio, though, this is my heart and soul. It's all about really writing lesson plans that allow you to bring science as practice into the classroom each and every day. So you can join us there. Or you can stay tuned here wherever you're listening or watching. We'd love to have you. Today, we're talking about modeling our love of science or our love for science because I'm still in this like love era. <laughs> the intention was to produce this in February, which is the love month, but um, spoiler alert, it's actually not February anymore. It's okay. Where I want to start with this is, and I'm always trying to bring you in my content, I'm always trying to bring you my experience because that's what I know. Um, but it's not wholly based on my experience. Part of my experience is research-based and research finding. And, and I always want to back up everything with substance for you. But I also want to leave you with the notion that reflection is so stinking important to being able to pull out these lessons for yourself. And it's how I was able to pull out these lessons for myself. Um, and in prior videos, I talked about the importance of reflection, but I do often share with you things that I came across that made me go, hmm. I don't know if you remember that song from the 90s, things that make you go, hmm. This was one of those things. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the snapshot of uh, in observation notes another teacher took of me this year. So we have this thing in Pennsylvania where we don't have to be actually observed by a principal every year. We do sometimes have the opportunity to, not sometimes, we have to every so often do what's called a differentiated project. And one of those options 
as a replacement for our observation is peer, peer coaching. So we partner with one or more other teachers and we observe each other's teaching in the classroom, our practices, and we write up a whole thing. But this is one of my high school science teacher peers um, feedback for me. So once want you to see it's very authentic, it's handwritten. I swear I didn't write it. <laughs> but she wrote, I love your energy and enthusiasm during this lesson. And the thing is, that's not the first time I've been told I have such high energy and enthusiasm for teaching. In fact, in years past, so this is a snapshot of, again, in Pennsylvania, I don't know how it is in other states, but in Pennsylvania, we have a system, it's called PAETEP, where uh, I don't even know what those letters mean as an acronym, but it's our evaluation system. It's where principals go in and they, they write a little something about us in a walkthrough or in a formal observation, and we can add some stuff there for ourselves. Um, I tried to go back and go back and go back, and I was able to pull up two, I think, from 2021. Uh, my former principal, I don't know my current principal real well, and he hasn't been in my classroom much, but she wrote, Lisa is upbeat and energetic. On another occasion, she wrote, Lisa's warm and friendly, classroom's inviting, energy is upbeat. Major kudos there for a 2.30 class, bringing it all day long. And so what I'm trying to suggest to you is, yeah, being enthusiastic, it matters, right? Not just what you do and how you do it and when you do it and all those things, but like who you are when you're doing it. All the things matter. And how important that is to our students in modeling for them so many things. I mean, I teach high school, so I perceive this also as modeling what your life could look like in a career, in a job. Uh, the underpinnings is positive attitude and all of those good things we want students to have and do, but sometimes we get into like such a rut and they see us down and they see us a little depressed and they see us dragging and they see us burned out and stressed out. And um, we, it's really natural that they would adopt that too, but that's exactly what we're always fighting against them. So um, this is the message today. And the thing is, people have told me this for years. <laughs> my internal reaction, it's never what I say to them, but my internal reaction is, aren't you? I mean, aren't you? Don't you love this? And even if you don't love this, isn't it like a little bit like a performance? I am totally guilty of feeling as though teaching is a bit of a performance because I feel like actors on a stage get my buy-in by doing it the best they can. And my students don't need to see my stressed outness. My students don't need to see whatever horrible happened at home last night. They just need to see excited, exuberant, love of science, let's go cheerleader do this me. And so it dawned on me that like, maybe a lot of teachers don't do this. Maybe a lot of students don't have this. And if so, what a shame. So I want to inspire you a little today with some other people who feel the same way. Years ago, actually, I mean, probably going eight-ish years ago, I had a principal who shared this quote with us, and I remember at the time just not understanding why she did. But this is a quote from Jim Henson where he says, kids don't remember what you try to teach them. They remember what you are. What you are. And there was a couple of things going on at work at the time. You know, struggling teachers, they were... Teachers are always struggling for engagement in cyber school, and likely they're probably always struggling for engagement in your school, face-to-face -face traditional school. And, and I mean, I had heard of different teachers doing all kinds of crazy zany things like pouring water on themselves, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not that kind of actress, okay? <laughs> so I didn't understand that at all. I'm not going to dress up for class to pretend I'm some character. I'm not going to use crazy accent. I'm not literally acting. I am just trying to create that classroom environment that helps me manage the classroom, that helps me inspire the students, that helps me do the things. Now, Jim Henson, hopefully you remember, he is the mastermind behind all of the Muppets. He gave us Sesame Street and The Muppet Show and some really cool movies like uh, The Labyrinth, 
And so just, if you're watching by YouTube here, a snapshot, of course we got Kermit the Frog and the Big Bird and Ernie and the Swedish chef who doesn't like love the Swedish chef. And so when we take into context his quote and we know what he did in, in creating these characters with an effort and intention to teach children, uh, we, you, you know, it's easy to dismiss. I'm not going to be a character, not going to adopt a persona to teach in my class. I am not an actor. I am not an actress. Let's move on. But I would challenge you to say that you can be you, but you can show your best you. And I could say you can still be what you are and present that to your students in a memorable way, in an impactful way. And hopefully it's one that reads enthusiasm and love of science. So my just wide open question here and the theme for the message today is what are you to your students? Because without you, believe it or not, you are a critical component of all this. <laughs> without you, it's just stuff. Stuff they have to learn, remember, and do, and all the things. You make the experience what it is through your planning and through your delivery. So what is what am I getting at here? What does that mean? I'm a student-centered science teacher. I got to always bring it back there. If we're talking, you work in a teacher-centered culture, you might be one thing to your students. And if you're talking student-centered culture, you might be a totally different thing. In prior videos, in prior podcast episodes, you've heard me talk about teacher-centered culture being one in which the teacher is an authority. And who you are to the students is the person who says, do as I say, do as I do. Do these things. And that's where it ends. It's a one-way street all the time. Even if you sprinkle in some questioning, the message that underpins that is still, I'm asking the question, you answer the question, right? <clears throat> Student-centered culture, the one I want you to adopt, the one I believe in so wholeheartedly, is not one of authority. It is one of a mentor. You are a coach and you are a servant leader. And there's a whole other message there I can deliver you. But if you think and you focus just on the idea of coaching and what the word coach really means, and if you have young children or you are into sports yourself, you know that as a coach of athletics, you're showing students what you students, players, your team, what they need to do. But then you are also constantly refining their skills. You're doing a little bit one on one. You're doing a little bit with the group. And then you're also like trying to develop a team sense, a team, a camaraderie and really intangible qualities and traits to produce wins. It's not different than what we're doing is can be very effective on a field or on a court as as effective as it can be in the classroom. So these are not just different titles, they are entirely different personas. So keeping with the idea of what are you, how are you modeling your self, your enthusiasm in the classroom? It's all about modeling and student-centered culture. You shouldn't have to say, do this, be this. You should be setting that example through your actions because I'm sure you've heard they speak louder than words. I have for you in this special episode, five short videos showcasing teacher enthusiasm. And what I've done is gone to popular TV and movies to come up with, you know, some, some, oh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, exemplars, that's the word I'm looking for, of both teachers we don't want to be and teachers we do want to be. What are the attributes of each of them? What are we coming away with? Are they student-centered or teacher-centered? Are they authority or mentoring? And would we want to be modeling what they're modeling? And I want you to remember throughout that the students are remembering what they are. 
Nothing they're saying or doing, but what they're being. And if you watch these clips with that sense, with that in mind, you come away with an entirely different idea. Um, so I apologize for those of you listening to the podcast. You're not able to see this. I would encourage you to jump on the YouTube and check that out. But I can do a little narration, so I'll do the very best that I can. Also, it should be really super fun because I'm using a different program to <laughs> bring you this today. And uh, my computer might freak out a little bit. We're going we're gonna to see what happens here. The first one we start with is pretty notorious. It is the economics teacher from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point, this is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. Okay, in some ways totally hysterical, in other ways so, so sad. Of course, the directors, the producers, the people who made the movie wanted to exaggerate this idea that... Um, Teachers and boring, <laughs> especially that teacher, right? Um, and so I ask you to stay focused on this idea of, is he an authority or a mentor? I think that's like, hands down, he's an authority. He's got all the information. He gives absolutely no wait time for the students to answer. They know it. They know they're not going to answer because he's not even going to give them the time to answer. He's kind of given them like multiple choice and options along the way, <laughs> not even waiting. And he's just like, in his own way, I believe he's excited about economics. So excited that he doesn't even let them answer. But he was also talking in like this crazy monotone voice. And so fast. Um... I don't think we want to model this, right? I think all of you would agree with me. Boring. Like if you Google boring teacher, or you go on YouTube and look for boring teacher, you see this guy. He, everybody knows he is the quintessential boring teacher. What don't we want to model about this is that students aren't involved at all. And there's no excitement in him whatsoever. Me, because I'm looking, I'm looking for that glimmer of love for his content. Uh, and I see it, but it's just not coming through quite the way it needs to, to create that engaging audience and to move the students in a positive way. So the next one we're looking at is Walter White in Breaking Bad. Now I found this deleted scene. I gotta say, I'm super fan of Breaking Bad. I've probably seen the series way too many times. It's the one reason I might always stay uh, subscribed to Netflix. Um, and I actually use his example several times in my professional development trainings because Walter White's brilliant. They note it several times throughout the series. He naturally is a teacher. He naturally wants to share his ideas, but I don't know. As you watch, you decide, would you want to be in Walter White's classroom? And I can tell you I'm going to cut this one short, but maybe we'll see. if we can ever get started. Here we go. All right, on the bottom we have a 5% solution of acetic acid in water and on top a triglyceride. These two liquids, both polar and nonpolar, are what we call immiscible. Ooh. 
no matter how much mechanical energy I apply, their molecular structure, specifically the cohesion of like molecules and repulsion of unlike ones, prevents these two liquids from staying mixed, as you can see. However, if I add to this a specific complex protein, which here behaves as an emulsifier. Ooh, everybody got your eye protection on? That's an egg, in case you didn't see it clearly. <laughs> egg number two. So, two things that normally have no business mixing, in this case, vegetable oil and vinegar, for example, can blend with the addition of the right emulsifier, forming what we call an emulsion. In this case, mayonnaise. <laughs> Okay, so Walter White, in that example, was engaging in that he did something really gross at the end. But truly, as a super fan of, oh, my microphone, you may not hear me. As a super fan of Breaking Bad, that minute and a half was a bit painful the first time I watched it. I was kind of like, where are we going with this? What is even happening? So much silence. No excitability. You know, there was... It's just, let's do this and this and this. And throughout the series, as he explains things to people, he kind of numbs them. Because even though he is so brilliant, he loves science so much, it comes through in the amount that he's talking. There is nothing else that is showing, hey, this is cool and I love teaching science too. Authority or mentor? Me personally, I'd say authority. The evidence that I would cite for authority is that he is speaking his students are positioned around him. His students are not asked a single question. Um, and they're not even asked for any any kind of feedback until the end when he, you know, eats his science experiment. And that's kind of shocking. And it's the most favorable response they give to him in the whole series. <laughs> so do we want to model this? You know, I think there are some elements we can take from it and say, sure. He is super smart. He knows his content, knowledge down pat. He has a lot to share, and especially in the way of doing a demonstration, he knows enough to put together that demonstration. And I think this is where science teachers begin to feel like, oh no, I need someone else's resource. I need someone else to build me this cool activity, this cool resource, this cool, because I'm not creative and I don't know it well enough to like whip something together myself. Walter White had that. But his affect was completely boring. You don't see his love of science in it. He's just so robotic. Me, I don't want to model this in my science classroom. The next one I have for you is Jack Black in School of Rock. Not science, not math, but hang with me. Pretty amazing. Spoiler alert. Nailed it. 
And 54 is a 45 north. And what is the answer, Marta? Nine. No, it's eight. No, it's <laughs> nine. Yes, I was testing you. It's nine. And that's a magic number. Okay. Is he an authority? Or is he a mentor? Where's my authority or mentor question? He is a mentor. And the evidence we give to support that assignment is absolutely the fact that he's engaging with his students. He's not just asking them questions. He made a mistake. <gasps> he knows his thing real well. Not really. He actually probably made an authentic mistake. Uh, the kid was able to correct him and he used a mechanism that they both enjoyed music t over something that nobody enjoys, which is math. And now there's a whole preface to this particular clip. If you've never seen it before, go ahead and, and you know, check it out on YouTube or Google it, Jack Black and School of Rock where the principal comes in, tells him they're not supposed to be playing music. And so he pretends that he's trying to teach math with music. But is that something we might want to do? Would we want to model this? Yes, absolutely. Are the students going to remember what that teacher was? Yes, they would. Someone who engaged with them, someone who loved life, someone who was positive and beaming and full of light and having a good time. You know, we don't want to send the message to our students that work is a drag. When we are a drag, our students think it's okay to show that things are a drag. It's not. We don't want them to do that. But it starts with us. It absolutely starts with us. The next one I have for you is kind of deep. Robin Williams, Dead Poet Society. And I haven't seen this movie myself, actually. But um, it's pretty inspiring. It's actually called Inspirational Teacher on YouTube if you'd like to look up and see the whole thing. And uh, let's take a look. Why do I stand up here? Anybody? To feel taller. Oh. Thank you for playing, Mr. Dalton. <laughs> I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. The world looks very different from up here. You don't believe me? Come see for yourselves. Come on. Come on. Just when you think you know something, you have to look at it in another way. Even though it may seem silly or wrong, you must try. Now, when you read, don't just consider what the author thinks. Consider what you think. Boys, you must strive to find your own voice. The longer you wait to begin, the less likely you are to find it at all. Thoreau said most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Don't be resigned to that. Break out. Don't just walk off the edge like lemmings. Look around you. There. There you go, Mr. Christie. Thank you. Yes. Dare to strike out and find new ground. Much of time? Yes. One. Somewhat appropriate, isn't it? Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a flying. This same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Who knows what that means? Carpe diem. That sees the day. Very good, Mr. Pitts. Why does the writer use these lines? Because he's in a hurry. No. Thanks for playing anyway. Because we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day. I just tell you I've got goosebumps Whew. it's like the next movie I'm gonna watch in full 
Authority or mentor? I know you're not here with me to answer, so I'm going to do it for you. Absolutely dead ringer for mentor. First of all, evidence. He gets out of the box in two ways here. First scene, he gets up on a desk. He's going an extra unusual step to connect with students. So he gets up there, and then that's not enough. He's not just saying, look at me. He invites them up there. Look at things from a different perspective. Not just do as I say. Well, it is do as I do, but... And then once they're there, he continues to engage with them and connect it to... I mean, and before you start watching, you may not know he's teaching literature or whatever. He starts to talk about the author's purpose and perspective and, and connect them. F students are moving. They're not sitting in their chairs. That is such an antiquated thing. The thing I hear most from teachers about, oh, it's hard to become student-centered, is, is that their attentiveness will wane. Well, maybe we need to redefine attentiveness. What does attentiveness look like? Are you afraid that you're going to lose control of your classroom? It's not as easily to manage. You have to adopt different strategies for management and reframe what it even looks like. What should instruction look like? What do we want it to look like? This man is a mentor. And then in the second scene, they're not in the classroom at all. They're clearly in some place that connects with the idea. And though he was not being bubbly, cheerleader, crazy stand on a desk, it was very, very serious. His whole strategy for ring the bell, ding, thank you for playing. So somebody got a question wrong. But that kid, whether he was joking and being sarcastic or whatever, that one strategy he had was pretty effective at both diffusing Un unnecessary, uncalled for, inappropriate comments, sarcasm, and also creating a comfortable sa safe space for students to be wrong because it's not a bummer, <laughs> right? It's a mentor. Thank you for playing. Next time, maybe you'll get it right. And his whole conversation, he's already tapped in and he's already shown them how committed he is to to all the things so he can go deep and he can go serious and the students they could tell. By the way, in all these clips of the mentor teachers, students aren't like bored stiff. They aren't look depressed and down. They're smiling, they're making eye contact. It's the epitome of engagement. And what brings it out? The enthusiasm of the teacher. So do we want to model this? Heck yes. I know they're not science teachers, the same things he's doing can apply for us. And look, I don't sit home and read science books. I don't prescribe to National Geographic. I do love me a nonfiction like documentary, but I, I'm just pretty much fascinated with the way the world works. And it excites me to be able to share that with people. I kind of find, I find my, my jam with Robin Williams in that regard because he's not just in it for the literature. He doesn't just clearly love literature and the message it sends. He loves being able to share it. So this is the last one I promise. This is Mark Wahlberg in the movie The Happening. Also, I've never seen it, but the clip is pretty fantastic. Let's take a look or listen. Look, I don't know if you guys have heard about this article in the New York Times about honeybees vanishing. Well, apparently, honeybees are disappearing all over the country. Tens of millions of them just disappear. There's no bodies, no sign of them. They're just mysteriously gone. It's scary, huh? All right, let's hear some theories about why this might be happening. Nothing? Come on, guys. More. Disease? Right. Could be a virus or infection. It's all over the country. A coordinated event in 24 states. A little tricky. Pollution? Could be. I mean, we're just pumping so much junk into the environment, they're just keeling over. But there are no bodies. Keep guessing. Dylan? Global warming. Temperature goes up a fraction of a degree, makes them disoriented. Maybe. Jake? You don't have an opinion? You're not interested in what happened to bees. Should be more interested in science, Jake. You know why? 
because your face is perfect. The problem is your face is perfect at 15. Now, if you were interested in science, you would know facts like the human nose and ears grow a fraction of an inch each year. So a perfect balance of features now might not look so perfect five years from now. It might look downright whack ten years from now. Come on, buddy. Take an interest in science. What could be a reason the beast have vanished? An act of nature and will never fully understand it. Nice answer, Jake. That's right. And science will come up with some reason to put in the books. But in the end, it'll be just a theory. And we will fail to acknowledge that there are forces at work beyond our understanding. Be a good scientist. You must have a respectful awe for the laws of nature. Okay? How much does the human nose grow each year? It's minuscule, buddy, okay? Don't worry about it. You're going to be a heartthrob your whole life. I was just messing with you. Okay. You know I'm going there. Authority or mentor. And I did strategically leave the science teacher for last such a fantastic mentor okay he didn't do a demonstration no he did not he came out of the gate with a current event and he was standing at the front of the room kind of authoritative students were looking at him kind of bummed kind of disinterested kind of not interested in throwing their idea in the ring but what did he do what was he he was the teacher that crossed the line that separated students and teachers. He was the student that physically became one of them and had discussion with them, is the only example we saw in this series of five videos that really prompted discussion. He didn't just say, ding, thank you for playing, like Robin Williams. He responded to the legitimacy of every single student's suggestion and said, try again. That might be the answer, but what else? And then he engaged with the student who was clearly not interested off track, ended up to be the maybe most thoughtful one of all, and he probably knew that. He probably knew that. As another teacher watching him teach, I'm saying he loves teaching because of his ability to integrate with students. Eye contact, facial change, body language, it was all there acknowledging all the good but keeping the mind open and really he at the end talks about the essence of science and because he did it the way he did it are students going to buy into that yeah you bet are students going to be fearful of answering him in the future probably not are they going to be more willing to answer the questions he asks yes and do the things he suggests yes is his feedback going to be more meaningful to them than maybe Mr. Economics teacher or Walter White? Yes, because this is the human part of teaching. Also a video I did. Check it out. Or a podcast I if you're listening. Your or a podcast if you're listening. Siri, she wants to jump in every now and then. All right. They remember what we are. So I'm going to ask you, what are you to your students? In the end here, we have two options. <laughs> we can be an authority like Walter White and like Ben Stein, and we can talk at our students in monotone without any eye contact. Or, and, and you can even see if you're watching by video, you can see their whole, their whole thing is so just blank. They are boring. Even though they might love their thing, it's not coming forth. We want to model our, oh, I'm noticing I've got a major typo here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Modeling needs an eye. The, we want to model this love like Mr. Guitar Man, Jack Black, and Mark, Wahl Mark Wahlberg. Just in the snapshots that you see of them. The facial expression is alive. The body language is connecting. Just in the pictures, you know it's true. And they are mentors and coaches and servant leaders. They're there clearly to accomplish a bigger task. They're passionate about the content and their passion comes through in the way they connect with students. They are not scientists. They are not rock stars. They are teachers in classrooms that are using those things 
to advance the children. And both of them interested in other opinions. Both of them asking questions, connecting. Not just a, hey, what do you think of it? Like, hey, what's this answer? Well, the math one was, I guess, a little bit. Hey, what's this answer? But giving them an opportunity to be wrong. Using student interests to park, spark intrigue was both of them. We use music to facilitate and make alive something that is totally boring for most people. Um, and talking about that kid's facial features and, and he knew about his hunkness and throw out a science fact. I mean, in that nugget, you saw that the guy he knows science. And he's inspiring them to know science based on like, hey, this is what you could know if you knew science. Both of them digging deeper. Whereas our former two, our former two teachers didn't. They presented what they knew and they left it there. And all of these things matter. So as I wrap up here today, I know I was a little long. I know I shared a lot of insight that wasn't necessarily my own, but it's good to take a break and sort of think about these things. If you've let burnout get the better of you, I think this is such a catch all. It's such a, oh, such a big excuse for teachers. And for me, I just don't even accept it. If you feel burnout, you gotta find a different way. Maybe you can't leave your school. Maybe you can't leave the profession. There's a lot of great things about our profession. Maybe you need to find a different way to do it. Freshen it up. And that's what I'm here for. So my little plug at the end here is the Active Learning Laboratory. It's so inexpensive. It is $7 a month for you to explore a different way, the student-centered way of behaving in your classroom. It really constitutes all the hardest things that I had to learn when I went about it the other way. I started with instructional design and creating this lesson plan framework and then delivering it and learning all these things that I had to do to support it. But really you don't need a specific lesson plan framework to get it done. You do need to know the difference between what excites students, how to connect with students, how to support and serve them, as opposed to just go to work every day, clock in, clock out, live your contract and be done. So if you're looking for inspiration, if you're looking for a fresh something, Active Learning Laboratory, you can look at it more, investigate more what's about it at labandeverylesson.com. You can connect to all my programs, all my informations, even my freebies from there. So I do actually share with you my lesson planning framework that I taught, that I referred to, the thing I started with, um, and all how to use it, as well as a delivery tool. If you've never um, been here before, you never checked anything out, you can go to www.labandeverylesson.com and grab that as well. I would invite you to our free community community.labandeverylesson.com. There you can get my three-step action plan for turning your science classroom into a learning laboratory, and you don't even need tangibles. You do not need to be the most creative person in the world. You just need to adopt some student-centered strategies. And there you'll get some insight, connect to some teachers who are looking to do the same. Please subscribe, like, share, or follow wherever you are listening or watching this. I really do appreciate it. Next time you see me, we're going to be talking more about love. It's the last week on relationships and love. We're going to be talking about teacher self-love, science teacher self-love, um, and that's totally going to come from my own experience. I and it's and it's really just going to be some tips based on what I've learned and things not to do, not really what to do, because I don't know anybody who has mastered that, honestly. But I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for spending your time with me today. Bye-bye.